welcome back to my channel. So today we are talking about an especially heartbreaking case, but I feel like the parents particularly in this situation have done amazing things with the hand that was dealt to them. They have been a huge light of hope to a ton of other parents struggling through the same situation, and that is the disappearance of Tabitha Tudors. Tabitha was 13 years old when she disappeared on her short walk to the bus stop from her home in East Nashville on April 29, 2003. Tabitha was in 7th grade and was an excellent student. She excelled in most of her classes. She was incredibly friendly and in the few months before her disappearance, she had started going to church with one of her best friends. She volunteered for spaghetti dinners. She was just quite a different little girl. Despite being 13 years old at the time of her disappearance, she actually acted both younger than that and wiser than that all at the same time. Most of the time she hung out with her parents at home when they weren't at work and she wasn't at school. She just preferred to be around them. And when she wasn't hanging out with them or her friends, she was usually with one of her neighbors. There were a few neighbors in the area, most of them a little bit older, that she would just go and sit with. She called them grandma. She would sneak over to one of her neighbor's houses in particular when her parents were cooking something that she just didn't want to eat that day because she knew her grandma would always make her chicken nuggets. She was just a friendly little girl full of heart and she was just one of those old souls I feel like that really just appreciated the more adult things in life and human interactions as opposed to those that usually younger teens like to involve themselves in. The morning of April 29th, 2003 wasn't unlike any other. Her mother, Deborah, woke up at 6 a.m. to start getting ready for work, and she woke up and noticed that Tabitha was sleeping at the foot of their bed. She didn't really know why Tabitha did this. Her guess was just to be closer to her parents. As I said before, she was such a family person, and in the middle of the night, most nights, she would sneak in, make herself a little pillow cot at the end of their bed, and that's where she would spend the rest of the night. So she stepped over Tabitha, went on about her morning, and she she left. Shortly after, Tabitha's dad, Bo, woke up to get ready for his own job as a truck driver. And just before 7 a.m., he gently woke up Tabitha, told her it was time for school, and she went on her own routine. Tabitha continued throughout her morning, but she still was not the only person left in the house. Her older sister, Jamie, and Jamie's children, Tabitha's nieces and nephews, stayed in the house as well, but they were all sleeping. And just around 7.50 in the morning, Tabitha left for her walk to the school bus, and some Somewhere along that walk, something happened. It was just a short walk from her home on Lillian Street to her bus stop, and the bus was supposed to be there at 8 in the morning to take her to Bailey Middle School. She only had about a 10 minute time span, which is plenty of time to get in the bus stop, but unfortunately was also plenty of time for something else to happen. The entire day came and went, and no one was aware that Tabitha was missing until around 4 p.m. Her mother worked at a local elementary school, so she got home fairly early in the day and would always be waiting for Tabitha to run in the door at 4 p.m. on the dot. She always was so incredibly excited to tell her mom about her day, but this day, Tabitha never came bursting through the door. Deborah sat watching the clock as the minutes just seemed to tick by forever, and she just silently hoped that maybe the bus had run a little bit late or maybe at the very worst, Tabitha had just missed it, but she was very concerned that there had been no phone call to alert her to this. After waiting a while, she decided to walk the three blocks to the bus stop, hoping that if she stood there, maybe the bus would just roll up a little bit later than normal, but the entire area was completely abandoned. There was no sign of the bus, no sign of other children, there was no Tabitha. She decided immediately to drive to the school because at this point in her mind, the only explanation for why Tabitha wouldn't be home would be because she missed her bus. However, she was still wondering why she never would have received a phone call to come and get her daughter. When she got there, the building was locked, there wasn't a sign that anyone was around, and Tabitha wasn't sitting anywhere waiting. So she rushed back home, and around 5 o'clock that night, Bo returned home from his job, and they both decided there was something incredibly wrong, so together they went back to the school. When they got there, they were pounding on the door over and over again, trying to get someone to open the door for them, and finally a janitor came and let them in. They began frantically searching all the hallways, thinking maybe she got locked in a room, maybe she just, you know, is stuck somewhere and people don't know. And then they stumbled upon a teacher and decided to ask if Tabitha missed her bus that day, try to get any information, and that's when, to their absolute shock and horror, they were told that Tabitha never even made it to school school that day. They immediately called 911 and shortly before 6 p.m. 
Tabitha was listed as a missing person. The Amber Alert was not put out for Tabitha, which I know frustrates a lot of us. You guys get incredibly frustrated in the comments when alerts are not sent out for children. I just want to remind you, unfortunately, there are specific requirements. There are requirements that have to be met, such as a known abduction. Someone watched a child be abducted. There has to be an accurate description of what she was wearing, what the car looked like. And because no one saw her leave that morning, no one witnessed any abduction, there was nothing that they could do. I think that has a lot to do with the fact that she was never found. Deborah and Bo knew their daughter very well, as did the rest of her family and even the entire neighborhood, and Deborah and Bo feared the absolute worst. Tabitha was not a young girl that would ditch school. I know when we are in our young teen years, we make a lot of dumb decisions, but Tabitha was very proud of her perfect attendance record, and that was not something she would be willing to mess up. On top of that, she was so attached to her family, she wouldn't run away for any reason at all. The school had never called them that day as I'm pretty sure they were supposed to to alert them of her absence. So unfortunately, this meant she had been missing since that morning sometime between 7.50 and 8 o'clock and there had been hours upon hours that were wasted. Within two hours, officers were canvassing the area up to about two miles out. And I'm gonna put up a picture right here of what the location looks like. She lived dead center in a massive, neighborhood. There is not much around this neighborhood. It is just a ton of houses and two different schools. So if she went missing in the middle of this neighborhood at that time in the morning when people are out drinking their coffee or heading off to work or walking to school just like her. Someone had to have seen her. They checked grocery stores, empty parking lots, massive fields. They checked different parks. They checked everywhere they possibly could and found no sign of her. 15 officers along with Bo and Deborah searched through the entire night, but still nothing. Media finally caught wind of the story around 10 p.m. the night she went missing, and they hoped that spreading this information as everyone was laying in bed, it would ring some sort of bell of someone who saw her that morning. Police searched over 72 hours straight trying to find Tabitha, but the one problem was that when they spoke to reporters, they claimed they believed she was just a runaway. I know there are a massive amount of missing persons that everyone says there's no way they ran away, and in the end they did, but with Tabitha, everything about her was just screaming the fact that she was a homebody and she was not going to put herself out there like that, but police refused to believe the parents, refused to believe all the neighbors, and they just kept pushing the story that she was a runaway, which leads a lot of people to not take it seriously, unfortunately. Even neighbors admitted to police and everyone that asked that Tabitha was like clockwork. There was even one neighbor that said if Tabitha was out before them to head to her bus stop, they knew they were late and that's how they kind of kept track of their own routine in the morning. And oddly enough, the morning that Tabitha disappeared, the family left and they were late to work that morning and they expected to see Tabitha but they didn't see her anywhere. She also had been so excited about a trip they were supposed to take to Six Flags in two weeks. She had been nonstop talking about it. She even had left behind items that she would have taken with her had she run away. She only left with the clothes on her back and her items for school. She left all of her personal belongings behind. She left her makeup behind that she loved. She left $20 behind. If she was planning on running away, at the very least, she would have taken her money to take care of herself. I know we've all been there as young adults, young teenagers, when we get mad at our parents or something happens, we want to run away, but you better believe you're taking your $10 because you think you are going to somehow cross the world with it. But she left it behind. Police ended up finding a bit of paper in her room with her initials on it and another individual's initials of M.T. L. And despite their efforts, they were never able to figure out whose initials these were. Now, I am honestly wondering if they checked the school system. Obviously, they have everyone's information, all the students that attend the school, so there should have been some sort of way they could have narrowed down 
whose initials those were out of that. But because they weren't, I am incredibly worried it was related to something else, which I will speak about later. They also checked the logs of computers in a nearby library. She often went there to talk in different chat rooms, but that all led them to nothing as well. During this entire time, the community, you guys, it warmed my heart like no other. They came to together for this family. Friends and family continuously brought over meals to make sure that Bo and Deborah and the rest of the family was eating something hot every single night and they even came up with an entire year's worth of a schedule. They all alternated to make sure this family was getting what they needed while they desperately searched for their daughter. Dogs were brought in within a week and something interesting happened when they tracked her scent. The dogs followed Tabitha's scent from her street onto 14th Street. So it was following her normal route to the bus stop. And then it went up Boscobel Street, which is the street her bus stop is on. But halfway up the hill, the dogs turned around and went back down, which indicated to everyone that for some reason, Tabitha was walking on her way to the school bus, but something made her turn around. All family members were questioned thoroughly and took polygraph tests just to rule themselves out and anything to do with Tabitha's disappearance. Now, there were a couple of things that happened with her older sister, Jamie. A lot of people had speculations from the start, unfortunately, when you are the only person in the house of a young girl that goes missing, rumors tend to spread. Police publicly announced that there were a few issues Issues with Jamie's story, but Jamie ended up coming forward herself and saying that the police actually intimidated and pressured her horribly. They told her that if she failed the test, they were going to take her kids away. They told her that everyone, including her family, was going to see her face all over the news. They made her so anxious that she couldn't even answer any of these questions without being terrified, which is one thing that can completely change the results of a polygraph test. If you were under any sort of emotional emotional distress, even if it's not directly related to the questions they're asking you, it can still show up as something being off. And unfortunately, that is what happened to her. Tabitha also lived in a neighborhood that was full of sex offenders and ex-cons. This worried both police and her family. So they decided to question every single known sex offender and ex-con in the neighborhood to rule them out immediately. This led them to so many different people. There was a husband and wife that lived on Lillian Street, just a few houses down from Tabitha, and they had been accused of sexually assaulting a minor just two weeks after Tabitha disappeared, which was incredibly suspicious. There was another man just down the street that was arrested months following Tabitha's disappearance for luring this young boy who just so happened to go to the same middle school as Tabitha onto his motorcycle where he took him to the middle of nowhere and attempted to sexually assault him. And this same attacker went on to attack another woman at a bus station. Years later, another neighbor was questioned because a family member of his actually came forward to warn Tabitha's parents, saying that this man, their family member, had sexually assaulted his own daughters and was in prison for 10 years. So they explored that possibility as well. But none of these people that were known for abducting and assaulting these minors and lived just a few houses down to a few blocks away from her were able to be connected to whatever happened to Tabitha that day. They were able to find quite a few people that actually witnessed Tabitha's walk this morning. As I said earlier, it was about 8 in the morning. That is when everyone's getting up, getting their coffee together, opening up their blinds, and a lot of people were very familiar with seeing Tabitha walk to school. One older man claimed he for a fact saw Tabitha go from Lillian Street to 14th Street, so they knew for sure she at least made it to 14th Street. A few more witnesses came forward and saw her all along 14th Street walking towards Boscobel Street, which is where her bus stop was, and a man that lived near the top of Boscobel, the same exact street she would have made it down to reach her bus stop, claimed that he had just opened his door that morning and saw Tabitha walking down the street reading some sort of paper. She didn't appear nervous, she didn't appear anxious, she was just walking to her bus stop. And the last person to possibly see Tabitha was a young boy. But this boy's story has never been validated. They have questioned his credibility since the beginning and have in fact stated him as unreliable. I am not exactly sure the situation around why, but I find it interesting because a lot of his information matches up with 
some other information. So this young boy claimed that Tabitha was walking up the hill or down the hill, I'm not exactly sure of which direction, and he said that a red car pulled up beside her. He said that they had a quick conversation, Tabitha and this man in the car, who this young boy says was a 30 to 40 year old black male, and then Tabitha got into the vehicle. The car then did a U-turn and headed back down the road. So you remember what I said earlier about the dogs. When the dogs tracked her scent, and it was multiple dogs, I wanna clarify that real quick, these dogs, followed her scent and then did an exact turn just like this boy had said. So I'm honestly wondering why his story isn't credible. There were no leads that panned out. They had exhausted all their options. They had searched as much as they were willing to search for someone labeled a runaway. And then that summer, they decided to zone in on a man that claimed to see Tabitha while driving another young man to the local high school. The man's story did not add up at all, and they were already questioning what he was saying. And then he started having many conversations with reporters covering her story and would describe her very inappropriately. He spoke about how Tabitha was developing physically and would kind of like map her body out with his hands. And he was also unable to give the police a solid reason as to why he was in that area to begin with, which made police wonder if he was a predator scanning the area. So he was listed as a top suspect in the case. Police searched his home in Shelby Park about two miles away from Tabitha's home and they used luminol. And luminol is a substance they spray over different surfaces and it interacts with blood and will show if blood was present at some point. No evidence was found in the home and the luminol did not show any presence of blood so they kind of steered their eyes away from him while still keeping him on the top of their brain as a suspect. Months and months passed and Tabitha never returned home. So the theory that she was a troubled teen that ran away that would eventually come back started fading and was instead replaced with the horrifying reality that she more than likely was abducted or met with foul play of some kind. On October 30th of that exact same year, this theory was solidified when a trucker reported a possible sighting of Tabitha in Linton, Indiana. The man claimed to see two young girls with an older man, and the one young girl in particular that looked like Tabitha appeared incredibly uncomfortable and anxious. To add to this, a hotel clerk around the same time also reported seeing two young girls, one of which they strongly believed to be Tabitha, accompanied by an older man at the hotel that they worked at but unfortunately, neither one of these sightings were able to be confirmed. In July, police realized that there was more than likely a lot more to this story than they initially believed. They decided to go on a massive search for Tabitha using dogs. At this point, they realized it's not just a runaway. If she ran away, she probably would have come home by now. They went up and down every single street methodically looking for any possible sign of Tabitha, but at this point, it had been months since she disappeared. Police and family at this point were incredibly dissatisfied with how the entire case had been handled. She was labeled as a runaway for so long, despite all of this evidence that this would never be a possibility. And because of this, many measures were not taken that might have brought her home. She did not run away. She had nothing to run from. I mean, she was happy. Police chief at the time, Deborah Faulkner, refused to take any sort of responsibility for this, which was even more frustrating for the family and the entire community. Instead of admitting and apologizing for the lack of progress because of how they wrongly handled the situation at first, she decided to instead blame the family. She claimed that it took over three days for the family to nail down what Tabitha was wearing, and she complained that they gave her an outdated photo of Tabitha. When parents are struggling with missing their own daughter, parents that didn't even see her that morning, parents that are trying to keep calm, keep their family together, and at the same time figure out how to help bring home their missing daughter, it's going to take a little bit. They did the best that they could and the fact that she called them out infuriated everybody. By January of 2004, Faulkner was replaced with, and I'm 
probably going to pronounce this wrong, I think it's Ronald Serpis, within days of taking over as chief, announced that Tabitha was not being treated as a runaway anymore and it was being treated as an abduction and he was going to put her case as top priority. Police and FBI both tried to figure out what exactly was happening in this case and then there were others who were trying to figure it out for their own. A longtime family friend, Johnny White, had his own theories. One of his theories involves Jamie, Tabitha's older sister's now ex-boyfriend. While Jamie strongly disagrees, Johnny White, along with a ton of web sleuthers, strongly believe that this man's involvement is incredibly likely. The morning that Tabitha disappeared, Jamie's ex-boyfriend got off at around 7 a.m., so just shortly before Tabitha went missing, and he worked at a nearby store. To add to this, he almost perfectly matched the description that the young boy had given all the way down to the red car. He had lived at the Tudor home before, so he was very familiar with everyone's routines, including Tabitha's. He knew when she got up in the morning, he knew when she left for her bus, and he knew where her bus stop was. So he knew everything he would have possibly needed to in order to abduct her. While the entire family was searching, it is reported that he refused to help search at all. So many people strongly believe that he was involved in some way, shape, or form due to the circumstances. Tabitha's own family even said that she would never get in the car with a stranger. She would only get in the car with family, so a lot of people think he was close enough to be family, she would have gotten in the car with him. Then an 11-year-old girl from Northport, Alabama disappeared in August of 2003. She had the same physical appearance as Tabitha and disappeared under the exact same circumstances. The girl's body was unfortunately found later on and there has never been any evidence to prove that there is a connection. They are incredibly far away in distance, but police don't want to rule anything out at this point. Deborah and Bo went on many talk shows trying to spread the story about their daughter and unfortunately this just ended up putting them in a perfect position for people to take advantage of them and it happened quite a few times. In one of the talk shows, a psychic told them that their daughter was no longer alive and was in the middle of a field. The same exact psychic told the exact same thing, almost word for word, to another family, but that family's son ended up coming home completely unharmed. So not only was the psychic wrong, but the psychic was also just kind of throwing the same story out to everyone. While the story that the psychic told Deborah and Bo was absolutely horrifying and nothing any parent wants to hear, it gave them the tiniest little glimpse of hope. And just to see that the psychic was wrong and to see that the psychic was throwing the story out to everyone else as well was absolutely devastating. I personally can't imagine what it's like to lose a child and have no idea what happened to them but as human beings we want an answer desperately and we tend to get fixated on certain things if it gives us some sort of relief and to have that for a second only to be kind of stripped away must have been the worst feeling. They also went through many different pranks. They actually had to totally get rid of their house phone because they would receive phone calls from prankster saying, I'm Tabitha, come and save me. They have been through absolute hell and back and have just had to roll with the punches while continuing to be hopeful that one day their daughter would come home to them. Garden was planted outside of a school. I don't know if it's the same one. I saw a completely different name, but I don't know if Bailey Middle School maybe just changed its name, but there is a garden outside of a school for Tabitha. There's a beautiful cherry tree, a concrete angel, and a bench that has a plaque in her memory. Brett and Bo also attended what would have been Tabitha's high school graduation to honor a moment of silence for their own daughter. Every single year since she disappeared on the anniversary, they have held a vigil for her. These parents you think after so many years you would just get so tired and so hopeless that you would just want to give up but they are trucking on and they are trucking on so incredibly hard and they are this beacon of light and hope and faith to other parents who are going through the exact same thing that years can pass and you can still have hope and you can still try your hardest to bring your loved one home. I'd place by your head, Brother Doris gonna say a prayer. Another year. Dear Lord, we thank you for all our many blessings. We Another reminder of heartbreak. Dear Lord, we just ask you to be with 
Tabitha, wherever she might be, dear Lord. Time doesn't always heal all wounds for Bo Tudors. It could happen to anybody. 14 years of feeling empty. 14 years of hell. 14 long years since his daughter vanished. You wake up one morning and you, and you kiss her goodbye and you don't see her no more for 14 years. It's, it's a nightmare. She was my boo and I loved her. I love her now. I love her and I'll miss her always, but I'm going to see her again. She's out there and someday she's coming back. With the power of social media in recent years, her family's working that her name is never forgotten. Let people know that she's still out there somewhere and she needs to come home where she belongs. With recent missing cases, including Devin Bond of Murfreesboro, Bo can't help but sympathize. Don't let it be 14 years for his family like it has been ours. From parent Just to parent. Stay calm and maybe one of these days he'll come home. Especially recently, they're trying so hard to use media now that it is such a huge thing to spread their daughter's story and spread her name because they strongly believe she is out there somewhere and it just takes the right person hearing her name, seeing her face to possibly bring her home. So that's why I thought this would be such a perfect story to cover because they have waited so long so long and they have worked so hard to get her name out there and if I can help them in any way shape or form I am going to do it. Since her disappearance multiple detectives have been put on the case and each one has gone through every detail from start to finish hoping someone from a new perspective might be able to find something but nothing has been found. Unfortunately other than statements of seeing her walking to the bus stop and a questionable statement about her getting into a red car of some sort they had absolutely no idea the circumstances under which she disappeared. There was no physical evidence left behind. There was nothing. It is absolutely terrifying to think that in just a three block span someone can just vanish in the most busy hour of the morning in the middle of a huge neighborhood filled with other kids going to school there were two schools in this neighborhood and not a single person witnessed any sort of struggle, heard anything, saw anything. How does that happen? In 2010, the FBI offered a reward of $25,000 to anyone who had any information on the disappearance of Tabitha Tudors. And on the 13th anniversary of her disappearance, the FBI increased the reward to $50,000, which is where it still stands today. They have said that someone might have a tiny bit of information, the most minuscule bit of information that they think is unimportant and they're not reporting, but that one tiny thing could piece together the puzzle that they are trying to put together. They say there could be one small thing that could bust this entire case wide open. And they are begging anyone to come forward with any sort of information. If it seems like the smallest, dumbest, most useless thing, report it anyways. Majority of the neighbors involved in the searches and chaos of Tabitha's disappearance have since moved from the neighborhood, which unfortunately means that her face and her story are also fading from the neighborhood. Her parents to this day and since she went missing have had a poster hanging in front of their home with Tabitha's picture along with all of her information on it for everyone to see. So even the new neighbors that do move in, they are aware of what happened, but they're too scared to ask questions. And at this point, people don't wanna step on the parents' toes, so everyone keeps quiet. But Bo and Deborah both say they want to talk about her. It makes them feel good to talk about her. They want to keep her story alive. They want to keep her face out there. Detective Stephen Jolly, who was on Tabitha's case, and I'm not quite sure if he is still on there. I know all this information I'm about to tell you is from 2016, so things might have changed since then. But he actually unearthed a witness that was never questioned by police. And this is in 2016. She disappeared in 2003. When Tabitha went missing, there was a rumor going around that another young boy watched her get into a green car with a scorpion decal on it. At the time of Tabitha's disappearance, this was just a rumor floating around and police could never nail down who exactly this little boy was, so they never were able to question him. 
However, Stephen Jolly tracked this man down who now is an adult and he has verified that he did for a fact see Tabitha get into a car that morning. Now, this isn't just a random person coming forward claiming to have information. He would not benefit off of giving this information. It's been there from the start. The detective was just able to actually find him and verify it. And even though his description of the car didn't match up perfectly with the other description the other little boy gave, it is still the exact same idea. That same year, Detective Jolly followed this new green car lead and it led him straight to a man named Juan, who actually owned not just a green car, but also a red car at the time of Tabitha's disappearance. Now, I have searched endlessly and i have not found if they were able to locate juan or not it went to the address that he had lived at and he had just moved i think about one or two years prior and they weren't able to locate him after this that i know of they put his picture out and asked people to come forward if they recognized him they were pretty positive he more than likely lived in the same neighborhood or had a reason to be in that neighborhood that morning but not a single person came forward claiming to know this man, which is incredibly suspicious to me. Also in 2016, two federal subpoenas were ordered for a man and his girlfriend. Detectives are certain when it comes to Tabitha Tudors, someone has to know what happened to that little girl in this neighborhood. And now with the power to issue federal subpoenas, those who may know something will finally have to talk. Federal subpoenas are now issued for two people who may know what happened to Tabitha? There's somebody out there that knows something, but they don't want to come up and say. And this here might be one of them that knows something. Apparently someone under arrest out of state, this man the subpoena was issued for, claimed to know something about Tabitha's disappearance. But when he was questioned further, he recanted everything. But he said enough interesting information to police to have the federal government issue these subpoenas. Now, they had to answer to the court, and unfortunately, this didn't lead to any new information. There have also continuously been sightings of Tabitha all across the country, but every single one has gone unconfirmed. So now we're going to get into the theories. So the original theory by police is that Tabitha ran away, which at this point, I think majority of people, police included, do not believe this theory. But I figured we would talk briefly about it first, because I have my own ideas going on. I want to clarify that at this point police have said that they are leaning towards abduction but they have also stated that they don't want to rule anything out. Tabitha never showed signs of being the child that would run away. She clearly loved being with her family. They didn't have any issues within their family. But we've also learned on my channel that people can surprise you. I might be looking too deep into this but she was on chat rooms, according to police, at the library. And something about this and the piece of paper found with the initials in her room, like, connected in my brain. I am sure, since they weren't able to find out whose initials they were, I'm sure they first went to, oh, it has to be someone that goes to school with her. Because it was her initials, Tabitha Tudors, and, and then the other initials. Almost like together, if that makes sense, like a relationship. You know, when people write their initials with someone else's and a heart on a tree and all these different things. Since I am sure they thought of the idea of checking at schools, and didn't find anything, I am wondering if maybe because she was so kind of reserved and to herself, wanted to be with family, I'm wondering if she didn't find some sort of person and developed a relationship with them on this chat group. The problem with chat rooms though is that you don't actually know who you're talking to and 13 year old girls and boys alike are prime targets for predators in these chat rooms. I think it's very, very possible that she might have accidentally disclosed too much about her location maybe. And again, this is just a wild off theory. I don't know to the extent at which they searched these computers. I don't know if they actually got onto these chat room history logs or anything. But if she disclosed too much information to someone that she might have had a crush on on there, this person easily could have targeted her. 
could have waited at her bus stop, known small things about her life just enough to where they could have abducted her easily. If these initials that were found on this piece of paper didn't ring a bell to family that she was so close to, didn't ring a bell to the school, she clearly was the only person to know the person with these initials and maybe was even hiding it. So I hope, I hope police thought to check deeply into all those chat logs because this seems like such a huge possibility to me. This person might have convinced her to run off somewhere. This person could have been an older teenager that maybe pulled up that morning and was like, hey, I'm so-and-so. Uh, we speak in the chat room a lot. You should come and hang out with me. And, you know, she doesn't get in the car with strangers, but if it was someone she had a crush on in a chat room, things might be a little bit different. Again, if she had decided to run off to meet this person, she could have encountered someone she wasn't expecting and something might have happened because of that. But the only thing that really gets to me when it comes to her purposely running away is that the person that saw her that morning, every person that saw her walking, she didn't seem anxious. If she was about to do something that was risky, that was going to take away her perfect attendance and possibly alert her parents to what she's doing, she probably would have been nervous. So I don't think it's very likely she ran away to meet this possible person she met in a chat room, but I don't think it should be ruled out because as I said, this person just as easily could have abducted her if she gave too much information. So this brings us into our next theory and we've talked a lot about patterns before and you know, how dangerous a routine can actually be. People scouting for abductions or trafficking, they look for routines. They scout out these big neighborhoods just like this one near schools where kids will be walking to school or taking the bus to school and they watch for, you know, these bus stops. When are kids going to be away from their parents, you know, walking unexpectedly on the street? A complete stranger could have snatched her up incredibly easily, while at the same time, because her neighborhood was filled with so many sex offenders and ex-cons, you know, her neighbors were watching her and knew her every move. Well, some of her neighbors were these sex offenders and ex-cons. They could have been watching and known her routine just as much as everyone else did. I know that they were questioned, but police have stated that some people have not cooperated with them and they've not been able to question a lot of persons of interest in this case. So I'm wondering if one of these people just so happened to be the person responsible for her disappearance. When it comes to Jamie's ex-boyfriend, again, he was familiar with Tabitha's routine. It is not an uncommon thing for spouses of older siblings to develop some fascination with other siblings. It's happened before. So that's also another possibility here. I know Jamie said that there is absolutely no way, but again, people will surprise you. I think it is better safe than sorry when it comes to questioning what someone was doing on the morning of someone's disappearance. At this point, I still have no idea if this ex-boyfriend was ever questioned by police. I don't know if he was ever listed as a suspect. I don't know if Johnny White ever got any more information but I am hoping this was looked into as well because he knew the routine, he was in the area, he was up and out at that time. And he matched the description almost down to a T. However, I'm assuming because of all that information, police more than likely did check on it. I just thought it would be probably a larger story if they did and I haven't been able to see anything about it. So I quickly also wanna talk about the two that the subpoenas were sent out for in 2016. I know that it led to no information and it was on a federal level, but I honestly wonder why someone random out of state years and years, over a decade after a young girl went missing, would randomly come forward while being placed in arrest and say, oh, I know information about Tabitha Tudors. I find that very odd. I know her case was highly publicized. A lot of people knew about it. I've known about it since as long as I can remember, but I just find it strange, you know, imagine being arrested. You, why would you first think of a case from over a decade ago and not have some sort of connection to it? And it really makes me question what this person's intentions were. I know that a lot of criminals tend to play this sort of game to benefit themselves when it comes to early releases and, you know, being given deals, but 
I don't know, something about it sits very strangely with me. But I'm trying to have faith that when they were in court and giving their side of the story, that they really were telling the truth. But unfortunately, even under oath, tons of people don't. Tabitha went missing in a 10 to 15 minute time frame. I find it very hard to believe that this was not a planned event. Whether that means she planned to run away or someone planned to abduct her. If she had planned to run out, I don't think she would just be casually walking to her bus stop reading what everyone assumes was her amazing report card from the day before. She wasn't appearing anxious or nervous or upset. She wasn't scared someone was following her. She was just going about her morning routine. That doesn't show signs of someone who is planning to do something that every everyone in the entire neighborhood strongly thinks they would never do. I strongly believe she was abducted by someone that had spent a good time watching her or someone that knew her very, very well and was able to convince her to get in the car. And I am inclined to believe the latter of the two. She wouldn't have easily gotten into the car with anyone and everyone was able to verify this. Her own mother said the only other person she would get in the car with was her neighbor and even then she would always come home first and ask her parents if she could do it. This was a neighborhood full of houses, full of people, early in the morning. Someone would have heard a commotion. She would have screamed panicked. There would have been some sign of a struggle. The boys, the two boys that witnessed her getting into a car would have mentioned this struggle, but from everything that's been said, I'm under the impression at least that a struggle was not involved, which means there is a high chance that she got into the car with someone that she knew fairly well. At the same time though, you have to keep in mind that it is possible that total strangers that aren't familiar with the area could still have found out the school bus times and the different schools in the area. This person could have simply been canvassing the area based on those school bus times in hopes of stumbling upon the perfect target. And it just so happened that Tabitha was the one they passed by while she was walking to her bus stop alone. But again, I I'm pretty sure she would have put up a fight. And the fact that all these people see her, she was on the same road where this man had his door open and he didn't hear any screaming, he didn't hear anything. It just really makes me question the entire situation and how close she was with this person that might have taken her. When it comes to Juan, the man that they are, I'm pretty sure still searching for, it will always bother me when someone in specific is called out and they choose not to come forward. Now, I'm aware at this point, a lot of people are very scared of being wrongfully pinned to things by police. However, when your face is being plastered, which his, his was, all over the news, it's on multiple websites, and you're being told you need to come to police to answer questions because they can't find you, mm, there's just something wrong with that. What are you trying to hide? What does Juan have to hide to the point where no one who knows him will come forward and tell everyone where he's at? I just find it so strange that if you're not guilty of something, why won't you come forward and be questioned, take a polygraph, bring a lawyer, do whatever you have to do to protect yourself, but to not come forward at all, just it's funny. Her family has been, again, through hell and back. Her mom went through chemo and struggling through leukemia just a few years ago. As far as I know, she is okay right now, but I mean, it's like they just keep being hit with blows, but they still remain, you know, it seems like the sweetest and you know, most kind and hopeful people. And I honestly have no idea how they do it at all. Please, you guys, I don't care if it's her missing persons poster, her story, this video, whatever, help her family share her story because it has been so many years and they are really relying on social media right now to help spread her face so she is not forgotten. They strongly believe that she is out there somewhere as I said briefly before, human trafficking is definitely a possibility. She was possibly seen in the exact same area at the exact same time by two completely separate people with an older man and with another younger girl that is incredibly alarming and reeks of trafficking, honestly. She could be out there 
someone might know something, spread this video as far as you can, spread her face, her name as far as you can, and let's help this family out. You know, they've done so much over the years. This is the exact reason why I have this channel. If I can make a 30 minute video that shares the story and takes a little bit of the load off of the parents in trying so hard to spread her name as far as possible, I'm gonna do everything that I can and I know you guys will back me. The Hallen family is so incredibly strong. Let's show them what we can do. Let's show them how far we can help spread this and hopefully someone will come forward eventually. There is a $50,000 reward out right now for any information. I will have the numbers listed down below that you can contact. Don't forget as well, there is Crime Stoppers and Crime Stoppers is completely anonymous. You literally put in your bank account. If this information helps, the money is wired straight to you. No questions asked. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Don't forget to give it a big thumbs up and hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Howland fan so we can bring them home together. And I'll see you in my next video. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.